Hi guys. It is a gray, gloomy, depressing day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here where I'm starting to get a little bit of case of tiny house fever. Uh, good lord, how many straight days of gray, gloomy rain have we had? So, uh, you know, just, just thinking of how, you know, while you're waiting for your neighbor to come at you with a gun, you know, if you're your last can of beanie weenies, just so much of the collapse of global industrial civilization is going to be pretty boring. You know, it's going to be long stretches of boredom, you know, punctuated by short bursts of brutal violence and uh, horror. You, you know, but most of it, it's just going to suck. It's just going to be boring. You know, you ain't going to have no gas-sucking car to go anywhere. All your little toys aren't going to be around. Uh, this thing called the Internet, anyway. But as long as we've got the Internet, oh, did I say it is Tuesday, September 27th, 2022. Not sure how long this battery last. So since uh, I cannot seem to find any more dead hemlock boards to haul up the side of a mountain here in the rain. Even the Amish people don't want to... <laughs> Sitting here on the mainstream media and, you know, reading all of these articles, of course, about uh, Hurricane Ian barreling down on the west coast of Florida, where some of you may be aware that I just bought a, you know, land in Florida on the west coast of Florida uh, in, in March, and I'm trying to buy the lot next door. Uh, <laughs> so even I am still buying land in Florida. Now, what I bought is just a vacant lot, but I am banking on the fact that at least for the next 20 years, these clueless morons are still going to be pouring in to the west coast of Florida. The west coast of Florida has been one of the hottest real estate markets in the country. I think it was the single hottest real estate market in the country at one point during the last year. That uh, people from all over the country and the planet pouring in to the west coast of Florida. So yeah, I am a doomer real estate investor. I'm taking full advantage of the clueless morons, uh, you know, hoping I can turn a buck. Uh, so we will see how my property fares over the next couple of days. But while all that is happening, uh, in the middle of all those stories, here is this little, uh, little outlier from USA Today. Climate change makes living at the coast riskier, but more people keep coming. Huh. Among the counties that trace the coastline of the contiguous United States, two very different pictures emerged from the latest census. One shows how residents fled after devastating hurricanes fueled by warmer than normal waters in the Gulf of Mexico, slammed into their communities. The other shows how coastal counties attracted millions of people to shiny new subdivisions drawn by idyllic dreams of life near the beach. The contrasting scenarios illustrate a growing disconnect Experts say even as insurance rates and flood claims escalate and federal scientists warn of the dangers of rising seas, extreme rainfall, and rapidly intensifying storms, Americans still flock to the coast. It is a collision course and people overlook the risks at their own peril. 
people in areas that have not yet been pummeled by hurricanes may not be keenly aware of the struggling recoveries in places like Cameron <coughs> Parish, Louisiana, and Gulf County, Florida, but the experts say coastal communities are increasingly at risk. A drive through Cameron Parish reveals bare concrete slabs standing as ghostly remnants of homes and businesses where residents once worked, worshipped, and played. Seven hurricanes and tropical storms over 15 years wrecked the tiny parish on the state's southwest, southwest coast. Uh, overwhelmed, many families moved away. The most recent census estimates, estimates show about half the residents who lived there in the year 2000 remain today. Over 20 years, Cameron Parish saw the greatest population loss of any coastal county in the lower 48 states. A similar exodus took place in Gulf County, Florida after Hurricane Michael ripped through with winds in excess of 150 miles an hour in October of 2018, laying waste to a swath of homes and timberland miles inland. Meanwhile, so I, you got that going on in, in those two counties. Uh, meanwhile, nearly 90%, nearly 90% of the 225 coastal counties in the nation continued to grow between 2010 and 2020, a USA Today analysis found. Uh, this is Matthew Hauer, an assistant professor of sociology at Florida State, quote, there is a certain amount of hazard risk people are willing to put up with that is probably higher than we think it is, judging by the fact that people keep moving to these areas. Close quote. Coastal counties swelled by more than 7 million people, a higher growth rate than over the previous decade. So, 7 million people moving to uh, the coast of the U.S. between 2010 and 2020, which is an uptick between 2000 and, and, and 2010. As, you know, the more and more doomers out there... Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, who am I to talk? Uh, I just bought land on the coast of Flo on the west coast of Florida, hoping to make a buck in five or six years to some clueless moron. So then they go, they you know they do the flip side and go and they take a look at Bryan County, Georgia, was the sixth fastest growing county in the nation overall. I think that's a little south of, I think it's the next county south of Savannah. So we're caught, talking the southern suburbs of Savannah. Bryan County was the sixth fastest growing county in the nation overall and the number one fastest growing coastal county. It saw a 50 percent increase over 10 years, which brought the population to 45,000. And uh, I guess some big car factory is moving in there. And then they, so they interview uh, the county commission chairman, uh, you know, who completely uh, laughs off the whole notion. Uh, quote, we have our setbacks and building codes. We make them, we make them build on raised slabs. Yes. Sea level rise, quote, is not at the top 
of our list, you know, of things to think about. It's just kind of on the back burner. We keep an eye on it. Close quote. Yes, I'm sure they do. And he is not alone. To the south, eight of Florida's hurricane prone counties are among the nation's 20 fastest growing coastal counties. Eight of the nation's 20 fastest growing coastal counties, or a lot of them, are are probably you know in the that storm surge warning you're seeing all over the papers right now. I'm sure that Lee County, Florida, you know, where Fort Myers, where my brother uh, moved in 2008, uh, you know, he's 77, I guess now. He completely laughs off the notion. Uh, I guess he's heading to a hurricane evacuation shelter for the second time in, what, two or three years, completely laughing off the doomers claiming that Fort Myers uh, is going underwater at least uh, before he dies. Uh, I'm sure Lee County, probably Sarasota County, where Sandy's mother, I don't know, Sandy, when did your mother move to Sarasota County, Florida, which is now projected to be the single, you know, it is the uh, eye of the tiger so let's all wish sandy's mama luck down there in sarasota and then on the other side historic saint augustine and wide white sandy beaches draw people to saint john's county in northeast florida that county's population growth was second only to Bryan between 2010 and 2020 with an almost 44 percent uh, increase. Sustained growth, sustained growth makes St. John's County, Florida, it's just, it's just south of Jacksonville, the single fastest growing county over 20 years with an additional 150,000 residents, which is a 122% increase. Population has more than doubled in St. Augustine uh, uh, over uh, the, the past 20 years. More than doubled as more and more, you know, information about sea level rise and hurricanes and storm surges and all of this. And as they said, skyrocketing insurance rates, flood claims. What is it going to take? <clears throat> New subdivisions with matching homes, community pools and clubhouses mushroomed at Beach Walk, a community now still under construction, a members-only club grants access to a crystal blue artificial lagoon and water park. The county experienced its own streak of passing hurricanes like it will over the next couple of days and nor nor'easters that eroded beaches and flooded homes, but partnering with state and federal officials, can you say state and federal taxpayers, they're spending millions to replenish the sand on the beach and the dunes just so it will get washed away again probably uh, Thursday night. Millions of dollars of taxpayers' money are going to go washing right back uh, it, into the Atlantic Ocean. But worrying about rising sea levels, and, and I guess hurricanes as well, just is not the focus right now, said St. John's County Commission Chairman Henry Dean. I'm one who sort of wants to peel one potato at a time, Sounds like Sandy must be making potato soup, a potato peeler. 
I never understood why people peel potatoes. Anyway, I'm one who sort of wants to peel one potato at a time, Dean said. For him, that means focusing on, quote, what is best for the current residents of St. John's County? Yes, uh, what is best? Uh, uh -huh. Recent studies show damage from rising sea levels may not be as far away as some perceive and will increasingly threaten communities over the next 30 years in Cameron Parish and other locations along the Louisiana coast, where as Book Hermit will arrogantly point out, where the ground is sinking, where the ground is sinking at the same time as the water levels are rising, NOAA projections show that that compound effect could put water levels in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, which is about 10 miles west of where I bought my latest place, the Gulf of Mexico 12 to 20 two inches higher by 2050. High tide flooding associated with the moon cycles also will increase. Uh, good Lord. Uh, the number of high tide flood days at, on the Louisiana-Texas border could grow from nine or ten days a year to 80 to 125 days per year uh, by 2050. Along the Georgia coast, high tide flood days could occur anywhere from six to nine times more often by 2050, flooding 49 to 71 days a year. NOAA forecasts similar increases for <clears throat> Massachusetts and for St. John's and Flagler counties in Florida. I uh, talked about this recently. Uh, the nonprofit Climate Central released a study estimating $34 billion worth of real estate could be underwater at high tide within the next 30 years. The national research concluded that as many as 64,000 buildings and 637,000 properties could be at least partially below the tidal boundary level. But people just don't like to talk about towns losing population. But that is unrealistic, said A.R. Siders, an assistant professor in the Disaster Research Center at University of Delaware. Quote, we're not very good in the United States about dealing with shrinking towns, whether they're shrinking because of sea level rise and other climate change issues, or they're shrinking because their economy has collapsed. Uh, urban planners in some areas, according to Siders, are, quote, forbidden from using population shrinkage as a planning model. They are only allowed to plan for the idea of maintaining or growing population. That may change as tax values plummet with properties increasingly underwater. She said cities and towns might need to look at mergers or other creative solutions. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, though some communities are elevating homes and building seawalls, Cider said that is, quote, fiddling around the margins rather than addressing adaptation at the kind of scale that will soon be required. Uh, 
Here is, then they talk to uh, Laura Lightbody, who directs the Flood Prepared Communities Initiative for the Pew Charitable Trust, said growing a community for economic reasons is often at odds with growing a community that will be more resilient to climate-related disasters. Quote, it's very rare that you find a policymaker or elected official, official who is willing to put future risk in front of economic growth. It's kind of a unicorn. Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's what's going on uh, on counties along the coast. But, uh, oh, I did want to share this comment from Michael. Michael has 12 thumbs up to this, uh, to this comment. Storms are not intensifying. The number and intensity of hurricanes is actually below average since 1850. The oceans are not rising. The problem is all those millions moving to areas which have storms and high storm surges. Obama and Al Gore both live in mansions on the beach. They know something the writer of this piece does not. Yep, yep, yep. Twelve thumbs up for anybody uh, trying to figure out what we're up against, but it, since my camera has not collapsed, uh, I'm just going to read. Uh, you can figure out, you can connect your own dots between that story uh, about clueless morons and this story uh, from the good old Los Angeles Times, and I'm getting more and more respect for the LA Times and this is kind of where they let these reporters, Erica Smith and Anita Chabria, you know, tell their opinion. And they let the on-the-ground reporters give their viewpoint on this subject. I'm going to read, well, I'll read uh, about the first half of this story. California spends billions rebuilding burned towns. The case for calling it quits. Yes. Most days, Ken Donald steals a moment to gaze at the forested valley that surrounds this remote grid of streets in the mountains. This is from uh, G Greenville, California. Before the Dixie Fire came barreling through the Sierra Nevada last year, leveling everything in Greenville, but a few houses, businesses, and a school. <clears throat> what happened there? Uh, this was a charming, if dying, gold rush area era town that about 800 people called home. Now, much of the charm is gone, along with most of the residents, replaced by the skeletal remains of conifer trees and the deathly silence of block after empty block. But even as Donnell has mourned, he has become grateful. It's good that Greenville burned down when it did, he believes, sooner <coughs> rather than later, because one day in a not-so-distant future ravaged by climate change, many of Northern California's far-flung rural towns founded in another time and for another economy might not get rebuilt at all. Gone could be the political and public will to spend hundreds of millions of dollars 
with Southern California taxpayers footing a big chunk of that bill to replace homes and businesses for a small number of people knowing that it is all likely to burn down again as extreme heat and drought keep decimating unmanaged forests. So, uh, where have we heard this story recently in another article? It's time to call it quits and retreat, said Donald. Resources are going to be drained. It's just the reality. These disasters are going to occur more and more frequently and in more and more places. So this is these two reporters talking again. By our back of the napkin math, which we calculated because no one in Governor Gavin Newsom's administration could provide an official tally, it will take about $1 billion, you know, of taxpayers' money to rebuild Greenville. Only about 300 people plan to return, and climate scientists say the town could catch fire again in as little as 10 years. So $1 billion to, so 300 people, clueless morons, can return to a town that will probably burn down again. <clears throat> we know it might sound far-fetched that a changing climate could one day force California to abandon entire towns in high-risk fire, fire zones in the mountains the way a handful of coastal communities have reluctantly embraced a managed retreat from rising sea levels. Probably talking about Louisiana and Alaska is my guess. But it's really not. Not when most of both rural Lake and Butte counties, for instance, have gone up in flames multiple times in the last few years, often displacing and sometimes killing residents. Not when eight of the ten largest wildfires in the state's history have occurred in the last five years, with the top three in Northern California. And then they interview this fellow, Daniel Swain, who I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, a couple of years ago. You can find my full interview with Daniel Swain uh, two or three years ago. Uh, making predictions, pretty much every one of which uh, have come true since I talked to this man. So what is Daniel Swain saying in hindsight? Uh, Daniel is a climate scientist at U UCLA. Quote, whatever risk tolerances that we collectively decided were acceptable for whatever reason, in whatever context, are no longer valid. That's because Californians built communities and infrastructure, quote, in a particular historical context that no longer exists, close quote. As journalists, we have covered many of the wildfires that have laid waste to Northern California. The two of us have seen the flames up close and spoken to people as they have returned to their homes and ranches to find little more than rubble, or even worse, the remains of a loved one. We've seen the... Huh. We've seen the... Huh. We've seen the... Huh, huh, uh, uh, in people's eyes when they talk about rebuilding and seeing the disappointment on their faces when nothing has changed years later. We have also heard the panic in their voices when smoke from a wildfire rolls toward a neighborhood recently rebuilt from the ashes of a previous fire. We are not climate scientists. 
disaster relief workers, bureaucrats, or firefighters, but we have interviewed them all, and we are merely saying out loud what many say quietly, something must change. What California is doing now is dangerous and unsustainable, yet it continues down a well-trodden path, never hesitating to rally around people who have lost their livelihoods to a disaster, whether it be a mudslide or an earthquake, but especially a wildfire. We are Hashtag Paradise Strong, Hashtag Santa Rosa Strong, Hashtag Grizzly Flat Strong, and now Hashtag Greenville Strong. And we, meaning Californians, have spent billions in taxpayer dollars to prove it, along with ensuring that Pacific Gas and Electric, responsible for sparking far too many of these destructive conflagrations, is now on the hook to pay billions more and to help rebuild. We do this because it is the morally right thing to do for our fellow Californians, many of whom are elderly and poor and don't deserve the misery and uncertainty of losing everything but the clothes on their backs. People like Donald whose home and business were wiped out by the Dixie Fire, the second largest in California's history to date. But the cold, hard logic of science has a way of poking holes in emotionally driven policies and moral certainties. This is especially true when it comes to the profound environmental changes underway because of human exacerbated aridification, meaning drying out of the planet. The same unprecedented drying of California's climate that has pushed the Colorado River and Lake Mead to the brink of depletion forcing Angelinos to conserve water in a bid to stave off further disaster has helped create the perfect conditions for massive wildfires in our forest, said UCLA's Swain, quote, the problem is these are places that were already high risks, but the risks have dramatically escalated from high to extreme, it is getting increasingly likely that we see these small towns in high-risk zones wiped off the map with every passing year, close quote. It's a pattern that raises uncomfortable questions about how Californians must adapt to live more sustainably in the future questions that many in government would probably prefer not to answer. For instance, should we really be rebuilding every single town that is scorched by a wildfire, particularly if it means we'll be putting people in mortal danger again? Or would that money be better spent fortifying a larger, more urban community outside of a high-risk fire zone or restoring forest and watersheds damaged by wildfire rather than, say, paying for new underground power lines and broadband internet service in the mountains of Greenville? And if we don't rebuild every town, which ones should make the cut and why? Even longtime Representative Doug LaMalfa, Republican from Richvale, whose district includes parts of Plumas and Butte County, has questions. Quote, honestly, how many billions can I keep going back to D.C.? to the well asking 
for Paradise, M Megalia, and Greenville, and maybe a little bit for Doyle, or whatever the next town is going to be. I mean, that's my job to keep asking, but it's, you know, oh, you again? Another fire? I will ask every time, but how long will they keep listening? Close quote. Exactly. Uh, and uh, I, I'm with these ladies. Uh, it, 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 this is bullshit that uh, American taxpayers uh, keep picking up the tab. Uh, you know, and I have federally backed flood insurance. I don't know if this tiny house is included or not. Probably. Make no mistake about it. Thank God for federally the backed uh, flood insurance here at Bugs on a Jar Farm. I fully expect to cash in on it. That's why I have the policy. Kind of the same reason I bought land uh, on the west coast of Florida six months ago. Uh, you know, these clueless morons. But it, it, it's going to stop. Uh, people are going to get sick and tired of, uh, of footing the bill for this crap. And of course, which neither of these articles ever mention, you start talking about all the rich people uh, like Donald Trump, uh, you, you know, taking full advantage of these taxpayer bail bailouts when their waterfront property or whatever uh, gets flooded or burned down or whatever. Just uh, let the, you know, let Joe Taxpayer pick up the bill. Uh, Anywho, this is, this crap's coming to an end sometime soon. Uh, but coming to an end, it looks like the rain has come to an end for about five minutes, and I need to run out and feed my ducks if they have not drowned in the rain. Highly suggest you get out there and feed your ducks. We're all in a row, I hope. While well, you still can. Bye, guys.